a speaker series. I welcome you all to Comstech Distinguished Scholar Speaker Series. And we have a very exciting lecture in store for you. This lecture will be delivered by Professor Dr. Ijaz Ahmed. He's the Faculty of Math and Science at Brooke University, Canada. The topic of his uh, talk today is Big Data Analytics, a lucrative tool for OIC. And with this, uh, I welcome our speaker as well as uh, the participant who are joining us. And uh, I would request His Excellency, Professor Dr. Iqbal Chaudhary, to welcome and um, to welcome our guest speaker for today. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, dear Professor Dr. Ajaz Samad, dear participants, we already have a very large number of people online. This very exciting presentation. This, uh, if I remember correctly, this is the second uh, lecture of uh, Professor Jaz for Comstech. And uh, Professor Jaz is uh, certainly one of the most distinguished individuals in the field of mathematics and its relationship with other uh, sciences. Professor Jaz is known to me since last uh, five years. We have had the honor of meeting each other both in Pakistan and in Canada. And I was extremely impressed from his uh, vision for science. He has been uh, universally recognized for his contribution and befitting to that, he is contributing at a much larger level. Professor Jaz is a professor and dean of the Faculty of Mathematics and Science in Brock University. He's an internationally known scholar, educator, and an accomplished researcher. His research interests concentrate on big data, predictive modeling, data science, statistical machine learning with application in many walks of life. His research has been supported by a variety of grants from the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of uh, Canada uh, since 1987. The Canadian Institute of Health Research, Ontario Center for Excellence, and other sources throughout his academic career. Uh, most importantly, his uh, NCERC grant was reviewed with outstanding in all three categories. Recently, Professor Jas has received a prestigious uh, Wolong ASEAN Chair profession, Professorship. His paper entitled Nanoparametric regression estimate based on imputation techniques for right sensor data received a grand prize advancement award by the International Society of Management Sciences and Engineering. The paper was selected by an international award member uh, committee comprised of 11 uh, mem members. Further, his uh, research uh, achievements have been recognized with honors and awards throughout his career including the prestigious status of the Fellow of the American Statistical Association Editor, Associate Editor of uh, several uh, scientific journals in his field. And he has been receiving uh, invitation from all around the world for his talk. So he's a very much sought for speaker uh, for the people all around the world. He has indeed authored a uh, very large number of publications, uh, research publications, books, chapters in different uh, journals of relevance. And he has an uh, extremely uh, intensive collaboration with people from all around. He is a member of the Discovery Grant Evaluation, Evaluation Group and Grant Selection Committee for Natural Science and Engineering Research Council, which is indeed an honor. He published more than 200 research articles and uh, made uh, literally hundreds of scholarly presentation all around. Most importantly, Dr. Ijaz uh, and I share the same alma mater. We both graduated from University of Karachi and then he moved on and uh, selected mathematics as basic tool, which is mother of science, and then employed uh, mathematics for the range of different topics. So over to you, Professor Jas, for your contribution today in this distinguished scholar uh, lecture series. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Iqbal Chaudhry, for your kind and generous introduction. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled. 
and 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 thank you to all of you your organizing teams to put this uh, lecture together and more importantly thanks to all the participants so from i see from various countries some of the faces i recognize and so it's good to see all of you and and let's uh, begin our talk today So this is a joint talk with uh, Faryal Ahmed, happens to be my daughter. And I am mostly in statistical learning. She is in machine learning. So I will be focused, due to respect of the time, I will be only focusing of the, on the statistical learning part of this talk. And so as you see on my, uh, my screen, let me go to presentation mode. Okay, so all right, so 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 let me first show you where I live. Uh, this is the I just jokingly say pictures from my backyard. It's it's a little bit far from the falls from my home, but six seven minutes drive. So it's a beautiful place to visit. And some of the participant I know from Malaysia and Thailand, they have already visited me. So it's a very beautiful region. I, I live in many different parts of Canada, but this is the region I like the most. So let's start talking about uh, how this big data business started. So there is a, if you do Google it, it's a hype cycle. It's, it shows you emerging technology. So it's, it's almost uh, 10 years or eight years now in 2013, big data, reach the climb the top in in this hype cycle and now if you google it you may not see big data is climbing some other things are keep coming and going but big data is still very important so in terms of the business analytics uh, we do descriptive analytics so to gain insight but from the sorry historical to interrupt you. Uh, i'm sorry uh, to interrupt you but uh, the screen is not in full mode uh, okay we see part of it okay how about this one can, can we uh, can we go on the slide show okay we need to i think enable the editing yeah right here yeah. okay. Is it okay now? Perfect. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. So, so there is most of the people do do simply descriptive analytics, and and then the important part comes to predictive analytics. So, to so we need to do modeling using statistical and machine learning techniques, and the important part is the prescriptive analytics. So, how to make recommendations? How to make decision? using some optimization technique and simulation extra. So I will share you with one of the slide from one business professor and at it's, uh, it's level of business impact and the skill levels required. So basically I call it four step for success. So if you, if you can do all these four things, and as I mentioned, descriptive analytics and then the diagnostic. So descriptive is pretty much dashboard reports and then the diagnostic is the data discovery how did it happen and then as i mentioned predictive what will happen in future forecasting and simulation and an optimization part comes in prescriptive so prescriptive is the most important part of the data analytics but most of the statistics department and and perhaps computer science department they go on, they don't go that far to teach the students about the prescriptive part. So, but some business school, they do, they go there. So if you really want to be a data scientist, you have to know all these four steps and then you, you can easily make a seven figure salary anywhere in the world. It's, it's, it's very competitive environment in terms of the skills required. So these four skills are very important for a data scientist.
so the the world data science you know although it was there for long time but most people do not understand what is data sciences and it seems like everybody is calling themselves i am a data scientist people cannot call themselves i am a statistician or i am a computer scientist but it is very easy to call yourself i am a data scientist and then the big data so what is data science what is big data and then what is the high dimensional data so in fact data science was recognized as a field of science at the beginning of the century so it's it's like a, you remember why 2k problem at that time data science was emerging but not much attention was paid and now the volume of the data due to technological advancement can be stored so that science is really get got lots of traction in past 10 years so big data to me it's a, sometime it's a big problem may not be valuable so we always think if we have more information i can do much better but that's not may not be the case all the time so it's kind of a paradox so paradox two reverse conclusion may holds so data needs to be extracted to make the data valuable for future study nowadays because we don't get data in a in a structured form nowadays so data pre processing data even massaging data and variable reduction these are the part of the data science data reduction it could be two ways you are only if you have a very large huge scale data you want to minimize it or there are tons of variables in your data sets just like in genomics study so extracting the valuable information from big data is called the data science so it's pretty much extracting the valuable information that's the most important part and then we get into the prediction and other parts and the question is where is data so if you look at this picture the data is hidden somewhere we are not getting data in terms of a data matrix in a nice format so now it is that's what the computer science come into the picture how to get structured data from unstructured data that's the first part of the, of the job of a data science so so as i talk about the data matrix you have n observation and p variables p predictors or in computer science language they call features we have p features and n observation so that's the, our data matrix so in one case we may have a large volume of the data so data is very very large we use the terminology n for the sample size that is very large in billions and the number two case large data matrix n is large and number of predictors are also very large so in in past in classical setup we used to have large n but a small p a small number of predictors so this is the case now instead of data matrix going this way is going that way so which is called the high dimensional data that the sample size n data observation is very very small as compared to number of features or number of predictors so that's the most important case of the data science and what's going on nowadays especially in in genomics studies so this is all the stuff about now is is 15 20 years old volume of the data variety of the data different types of data it's not only number it could be text emails and the velocity the speed of data processing it's not like old days we collect the data uh, in the lab or outside and then we sit on it for a month and so and then we process the data but now data is keep coming there is another word data streaming like a river water is flowing data is flowing so there is no time to stop and then and and then look at later and for a for a statistician for me veracity is the most important part in this data analysis which is uncertain uncertainty and in precision in the data data may not be imprecise that's what i said the big data more problem more impre imprecise data can be there so we have to deal with all this kind of situation 
So data, I will speak a little bit more on data veracity. It is believed that veracity is due to data inconsistencies, incompleteness and approximation. We are doing lots of things when we are dealing with the big data. So whatever be the real causes, it is hard to identify and pre-process the data for veracity, especially in a big data setting. If you have a small data, you can deal with it. So the issues are even more complicated when data are streaming. So when data is like a river, water is flowing. A consequence of the data veracity is that statistical assumptions used for analytics tend to be inaccurate. So whatever classical methods we have it, they, they may not be helpful. So we have to be very, very careful. So data streaming is, is another story and commonly encountered in several business and industrial application leading to the so-called big data also. So data streaming are countered in a variety of contemporary application in business and industry. This is more application in business as compared to genomics or, or science. So data streaming is the process of sending data records continuously, you know, keep going like your, in your credit card data rather than in the batches. A streaming is used to examine continuous data stream and quick detection with a small time period after receiving the data. For example, you go and you want to buy furniture or car and you want to apply for the credit. So the, the person fill in for, take information from you feed it to computer and the algorithms take over. And then algorithm decide is there is no person sitting at their side to make a decision. Algorithm will decide whether they approve your credit or not, uh, or not within few seconds or if not seconds in few minutes. And some example in genetic microarray studies, the sample is subjects are measured in hundreds. Now we can do in thousands and the number of features P or number of predictors per sample can exceed millions. So this is the example of high dimensional data. So for 2,500 unique protein implies 253 billion possible protein to protein interaction. So you can imagine the predictive model is like a predictive engine with the 253 million possible features. Facebook, more than 950 million people. And then data combination of different health data banks with greater heterogeneity. We used to deal with homogeneous data, but now there is a heterogeneity in the data over the time or even the space. And in industrial application, massive data are collected for the statistical process monitoring. So these are the few examples of big data, uh, which also includes the high dimensional data. So about genomics, uh, actually the big data started, high dimensional data started from genomics. So nowadays, you know, nobody needs to give any reference or anything else, just Google it and you will get the, all the information about the genomics. So I will just skip this slide. So the processing and the volume challenge in financial analytics. So as I mentioned, for example, financial credit card example, the data set contained almost a million observation and include information and in more than 45 variables, such as default payments, demographic factors, and so on, so on. And the data is, has a heterogeneity problem. There may be outliers and then round off errors. So when you round off few numbers, the error may not be that huge, but when you are rounding million of the numbers, the error could be huge and impact could be huge. And then there is another kind of data we are dealing with imbalance or skewed data sets. So it can be skewed from one majority group uh, that are larger than the other minority groups, which is nowadays uh, in the EDI, the equity, diversity and inclusivity, this is a big problem. And for example, credit card detection, credit card scoring. And so there are some statistics are given on my slide, so I'm not going to, to just read it. So I can send the slides to, to organizers, uh, organizer and they can share with you later on. 
So the big question is how to acquire, manage, process, analyze, and make sense of the data. It's not it, for a statistician. When I finish my PhD and start working my research, I'm pretty much on the analyzing. I I get the data from somewhere. So, but now even acquiring the data, acquiring the data, how to manage it, and then process and analyze came in the end. So, big data is the future of science, and transdisciplinary research in statistical science is must one. We just cannot just work in a cubes in a, or in, in just in an office ourselves. We have to collaborate with other people. So the question is, are we training the data scientists in OIC, OIC, OIC world or OIC states? And this is not an expensive or difficult part as this, Dr. Iqbal Chaudhary knows, doing chemistry is not easy. It's very expensive. And I was amazed to see the facil facility of the labs and the machines at, when I visited Karachi University and his institute. But uh, for data science, we don't need that much big investment. Uh, the OIC states can pull the forces together and, and put some centers, few centers here and there, just like ASEN countries are doing it. They have professorship, which was mentioned, and they are moving around among seven or nine countries. So AIS, OIC can do the similar things and train the people. So it's, it's, there are two kinds of trainings. One training, they're both important. One training is you train people to analyze the data and they get the data and they use the existing technology or existing techniques to analyze the data. But most importantly, we have to do pure research in this area also. So we don't need to buy the research from other countries. To me, doing research is much cheaper than buying research. Maybe it is expensive in the beginning, it much become more cheaper than buying the research. So we have to also build the research centers where our young people or our data people from from the various host of fields they can do the data science it's not only for math and stats people or computer science people it can be done from various sectors and about is the one of the best job okay i will miss that part this is this is the faryal does about the learning so i will skip it I will just give you a few, some background about machine and statistical learning. So what is learning? This, this term was coined in 1959, a machine learning term, and the checker games and later on Jeopardy, they, they use these techniques. And according to Tom Mitchell in 1997, he says a computer program said to be learned from experience E with respect to some classes or task T and performs major P. So there is a technical definition for, 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 for its performance P and its task on T as measured by P improves with experience E. So in the end, it's the experience, it's the learning experience. So that's what it is. Although, and there are many examples, fraud detection, personalized medicine, advertisement, speech, pattern, face recognition, and the field of machine learning originates from computer science, of course, mostly from the artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence and statistics came some years ago and then, then artificial intelligence went into back further, but now it came back again. So there are different jargons in, in machine and statistical learnings. So supervised learning, in statistics, we have a logistic regression, classification, or just regression models. Unsupervised learning, in statistics, we have cluster analysis, principal component analysis, and association rules. And it's not uh, just between zero and one, like supervised and unsupervised. There are lots of things in between supervised and unsupervised learning, which is called weekly supervised. So some of the machine learning techniques has been used by random forest, support vector machine, decision trees, which is card classification and regression trees, in sample methods, 
bagging, bootstrap, aggregation, boosting, stacking, neural networks, and deep learning. So there are few of them are quite popular and there are many others. So I will go back to the statistical learning. How we deal with the, nowadays we, how we deal with the model when we have a high dimensional data, when there are lots of lots of uh, variables. So, so in the statistical learning, biggest assumption is that that model is sparse. So sparsity is the name of the game. There could be millions of predictors, only few are important, rest of not important. So that's what they call the sparse modeling. And we use techniques like lasso and many others to select the few, few predictors which are important. And then what happened, we select a sub-model and some model predictors are easily interpretable and efficient compared to full models. So in full models, you may have a millions of the variables. In some models, you have a only few one. And then we do the interpretation. So is it end of the story? We from a, from a much bigger model, we, we deduce a sub model and then work on the sub model. So we must dig in deeper. So I will go to my my other presentation file, which has more technical things. So just give me a moment. Okay, I am back. So now I will go a little bit uh, more technical side of it. Uh, first, we talk about the general side of it because there is a mixed crowd. So I wanted to to do a little bit for both both groups who are more technical savvy people. So let's talk about uh, regression model in terms of suppose uh, or in terms of computer science we have a supervised learning. So we have this model, usual model, Y is the outcome, X is the data matrix, beta is the regression parameters as usual. So the only difference is that, that we are having P, the number of predictors are larger than sample size n. So that's the situation which I've mentioned in, in genomics example and many other example. This is the real situation. So classical st statistical techniques, for example, if uh, you recall the least square estimation may not work completely because they are not equipped to deal with P larger than n. So it is, if you think about it, So what do we do? We partition the parameter vector beta into beta one and beta two. And we say regression parameter beta one is the most important one. So in many application, it is assumed that model is sparse, which I talk about the sparsity earlier, that many coefficients are zero some of them are not. So beta two is a null vector. So we have P one, which are non zero one and P two is greater than N. So P one is less than N. So we are back, we are in a friendly grounds now. We can, we can work on this sub model. So 
it's a variable selection techniques provides you a sub model. So sub model has only P1 variables. So keep in mind. So the parameter of interest, the things which we would like to estimate is regression coefficient vector beta one. And, and the dimension is less than n. So in fact, we are doing a post estimation so of in this model, so what we did, we partitioned beta into beta one and beta two. So now the question is, is come, how to do the variable selection when we have our simultaneous estimation, when we have this high dimensional situation. So write down your objective function into this one, the only part is this, this is, if you recognize the statistics and math students, this is what least square estimation we do. And here is the additional part. And, and this pi beta is defined by this and lambda is the tuning parameter. So this thing was there long time ago. So it's called the, if it is, if you look into here, this value gamma, if gamma is two, then we have a ridge regression and we've penalized the residual sum of the square. And lambda is the tuning parameter which controls the amount of shrinkage. So what this techniques does, it shrinks the weak coefficients in the model like beta two components towards zero. So it's pushed them towards zero and then we get a sum model on the P1 variable. So this ridge regression was there, but people did not think about it as a penalized method they were using to deal with multicollinearity. So over four decades ago, Hodel and Kennard proposed ridge regression method, which is designed for correlated and ill-conditioned settings. So as I said, they did not envision that method can be used in, in problems where P is greater than N. So what new things came in last decades and so L1 penalty, instead of a square, we are looking at the absolute penalty. That's what it is. So if this penalty shrinks the coefficients towards zero and depending on the value of lambda, the tuning parameters, it sets some of the coefficient exactly to zero. Ridge regression will not do it. So it, they also have a close connection with the Bayesian method. I will not go into the Bayesian inference uh, to, in, because we don't have much time, but there are some references. So the reason for doing the penalized method is that we want to get a sub model, a smaller models, which are easily in, 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 in interpretable comparing with the full models. And some model estimators are relatively efficient than the full model estimators. So once again, I talk about this thing earlier in my earlier slide, end of the story, really? Let us dig in deeper. So here we go. This is a good strategy. If true more, if the model is truly sparse for like uh, uh, genomics data, only few variables are good for prediction, the rest are not useful. So there is a problem with an underfitted model. So some model also called the underfitted model because you have a much smaller one. And uh, so the sum model estimate are biased unless you correct the right sum model. So you have to be very careful in, in the prediction process. So bias is the biggest problem in the big data. And it's, you know, if, it's, if you have a small number of predictors, there'll be small bias. If you have large number of predictors, you have much, much huge bias. So we need to control the bias. 
So I will show you mathematically for some of our participants how this bias can be seen. So you take the expected value of the model, which is x1 beta 1, x2 beta 2. And then you can the para, keep in mind, we are interested in, in beta 1, the most important coefficients. So the expected value will be beta 1 minus this quantity. So bias is this quantity. So unless, so you look at this quantity and I put two conditions. If the regression coefficients corresponding to deleted variables beta are zero, then bias is zero. As I said, if you selected some model is the right one, then no problem. Or on the other hand, x1 prime x2 are orthogonal, but this is, this is a completely unrealistic assumption. It's not possible in that huge data matrix. So there is a dominance condition. So this is the most important part. Our so-called data science people, they miss it because they didn't have this training inside from the statistics. So bias will increase without a bond. Consequentially, the, the MSC, which is a metric of uh, measuring the error, will explode. So it's like you want to tell uh, you are a financial manager and you tell your client you will make a million dollar of this investment, but then you will lose all of your money. So with that kind of risk. So it's not a good trade-off. So I paraphrase uh, George Box the statement, all some models are biased, but some of them useful. So we better find a good bias some model. So a knife data analyst data scientist, data miner, and now even data engineer. My own son, has, his, his new title is a data engineer, although he has a business degree. So he just jokes about me that I, daddy, I have engineer, I'm engineer without having engineering degree. So those all kind of new titles are keep coming, but they may not comprehend that dropping X2, the, the unwanted variables will have an impact drastic impact on prediction later on. So generally, law of unconsciousness may work. Most of the time, we say ignorance is blessing. But in data science, in, in this prediction business, the law of unconscious, unconsciousness will not, may not, and will not work. Please mark my words. So we need to find a better trade-off between bias and need to control the bias bias and variance and we need to control the bias. So, so these are the penalty penalized methods. They are useful in this, in this thing, but the assumption of sparsity in the model that most coefficients are exactly zero if you're not, it's a big assumption. How do we know? And how we can partition even? Not only that, non-zero coefficients are big enough to be separated from the zero ones. So we need very powerful algorithms to do those things. And then there are some technical assumptions. I will just for, for the completeness. So the over parameterization and overfitting. So either we have a very huge, a, a, a model regression model with too many predictors are included in the initial models and then underfitting too many predictors are deleted from the initial model. So if you do dam, if you don't do dam, so in both cases, we are we have issues. So how to deal with those things? So the issue is, is the model interpretation, how to interpret the model if there are too many predictors and then the prediction accuracy, how accurate is your prediction and then how to deal with the bias. So these are the three main issues with this penalized likelihood techniques. So we suggested, which is a paper published a few years ago, it, it was a discussion paper, that they split the signals into strong and weak signals and use any machine learning techniques to detect these strong signals. A strong, I'm using engineering terminology, strong signal means the influential variables and the weak signal means less influential variables and, and the noise, no signals. 
So we suggest that you, you combine two models, a model with many variables and a, a model, a sub model with a few variables and then see how we can improve the prediction error. So we, there is a shrinkage technique, which I have been working since, since my PhD thesis 1987, uh, which can be extended because that technique is, is only useful at that time for fixed P. So we have extended this result. So I will not go into the technical details of this one because of the time. So I will show you, and there are some, some technical assumptions, but I will show you how we can define it. So we define a some model estimator with this quantity based on set S1. S1 is a strong signal. So we select a post-selection estimator to improve the prediction performance of the PLS estimator. So this based on X1 data, strong signals. So this is the paper I, I mentioned, we published in 2017 for this work. And then it was uh, the editor decided to make a discussion paper. And there are four, there was four discussion in this paper. And you can find all this thing by just Googling it. And I will give you the reference in the end. So it is a little bit more technical here. So I want to show you what I'm doing. So this is, you see, this is some model estimator and this is the rich full model estimator. And I combine them through a test statistics. So which is the test statistics. So, so if, if the full model is more, is, is more, more suitable, then this estimator will shrink towards full model. If some model is more suitable, then this estimator will shrink towards some model estimator. So this is the beauty and power of this estimator. So it is adoptive in nature. So it's going, it's like a, you know, if I live in a, I call it restrictive society to unrestrictive. So which society we shrink? More restrictive one or more unrestrictive one? So that's what it is. So, and, and I can do all kinds of theoretical works on this thing. I can calculate the risk of those models and, and the bias of those estimators. And this is all fancy Greeks letters. I love them. And perhaps some of you also. So, so I have shown mathematically that my estimator, proposed estimator does better than penalized methods and other methods under some condition, of course. So this was mathematical proof and mathematical proof are cre creative. But you know, when I think about creativity, but creativity is, is, is also subjective. The truth is not. So what should we do? I call it engineering proof, simulation or artistic proof. Why it is artistic proof? Because it's just like when you are doing simulation, you are just like an artist. You can put, you can give different parameter values as you wish in the model. So you can, as an artist, you can make somebody eyes bigger, smaller, nose bigger, smaller. It's, it's, it's your own control. So same thing when you are doing simulation, the value of parameters in your control. But I don't mean to say that they are less than our, the creative proof. They are also very important nowadays because models are getting very complicated and you cannot get a mathematical proof. You can't get the creative proof. So, so what I'm doing here, I'm calculating the relative mean square error by taking the ratio of full model divided by any other model. So if it is greater than one, then the proposed methods are doing better. So let's look at uh, some of the simulation experiment. So what we are doing, we have a strong signals, one, five and three, two, and then we have a weak signals, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and then we have a no signals, zero. And 
So let me show you the table. So this is P1, a strong signals. So there are only three strong signals in our simulation studies. And this 30 is the weak signals. So this is some model estimator. This is my suggested estimator. And this is penalized method SCAD. This is penalized method MCP. This is penalized method A lasso. This is penalized method lasso. So I'm comparing with very different methods. So with this case, my method is doing eight times better than full model estimator, but the penalized methods are much better than my method except the lasso one. But as soon as weak signal started increasing, the performance of my suggested method is, is still very good and very competitive with the penalized method. But when it's close to 231 weak signals, I am doing much better, much better than all this penalized method. So why it's happening? Because bias, as I mentioned the bias, the penalized method are forcing weak coefficients towards zero. We are not forcing them. We are borrowing the strength to make it prediction accuracy much better. So similar results are there. So let me go to the uh, data example now. So this is a quite famous data to reported in sheets at all in 2006 and also analyzed by my friends Huang Ma and Zhang in 2008. In this data says, 120 12 weeks old male of spring of F1 animals were selected for tissue harvesting from the eyes of for microarray analysis. The microRNA used to analyze RNA from the eyes of these F2 animals contain over 31,000. So this is your sample size and 31,000 different prop no this is your uh, this is sorry here is 120 is your sample size n and, and 31000 is your number of features predictors so for each prop set gene expression intensity values were normalized using rma robust multi chip I, you guys from chemistry will know better or biology i have no idea sometime what they are talking about but but i can analyze the data anyway so in the end, a regression analysis was conducted to find the props among the remaining 18,975 that are most related. So this is the data cleaning before even doing the analysis. So out of 20,000, they pick 18,975. So now we apply our techniques to different sub models. So by using penalized likelihood methods, lasso and a lasso one method pick 24 variables importance and other methods pick 19 variables important so you can see starting with so many variables and we only get in the end 19 or 20 important variables but each method picks different number of variables and the problem is this 19 and 24 may be completely distinct so so but that's that's what it is the because the the attention on the prediction accuracy and then we calculated the prediction error by relative prediction error by using this formula just let me show you the box plot prediction error so look at the picture b so this is based on these two are based on the penalized likelihood method lasso you can see the prediction error how large it is. So if the center is here, prediction error is going both direction very large. And the, the last two box plots are the prediction error based on our methods. You can see we minimize the prediction error drastically. It's, it's unbelievable that how much bias can create the problem for prediction error. So we have shown our work mathematically and numerically through the simulation study and also through the data set that our method is much far superior than those penalized methods for sure if 
if there are weak coefficients in the model. If there were no weak coefficients in the model or weak signals, probably the, the performance would stay the same. So pretty much I think I'm running out of time or almost run the run out of the time already. So we have generalized the shrinkage estimator to, to the high, high dimensional data set. And let me go back to my, again, other, other presentation, which have more better references. Okay, so just to close it off. So there is a statistic, there's a computer science and there is a data science. So to me, it seems like there's a clash of cultures here going on because some diehard statistician, they don't much believe on machine learning techniques and some computer science people, they, they say, oh, well, statistics techniques are there, but assumptions are, are too stringent. So in, in, in the culture was in the statistical sciences that we pre-process sample data, classical assumption, exact analytical solution, low dimension data analysis. We use SAS, SPS and other packages. And even we use our open source programming, very idealistic. A statistician used to call mathematician, they're idealistic. But now a statistician become very idealistic themselves, work alone, or in a small teams and glory of the individuals. But culture in data science, it's a big data available from different sources. You have to frame the problem yourself. You know, the company manager or will throw a data on you and he won't tell you what's my hypothesis and, and what's not. You have to analyze the data and you let me know how I can make more money. That's all it is. So identify the data for analysis. And now the concept or distinction between population and sample data is pretty much gone. People who are doing data analysis, they don't realize are they working with a population data or they're working with a sample data. So now we need new tools for new data, Python and R, and there are many, many open sources programs are available and keep developing. And parallel and cloud computing system, Hadoop, Sparks, and many, many others. And I didn't talk about the visualizing of the complex data. This is another big issue itself. And then combining data, data fusion, they call it record linkage, text returns, court records, and health agencies, etc. For example, you know, when you are combining the data, you make, make some mistakes and that's what the error will come with the people with same name can, and you can combine their records and it's a big problem. And then high dimension statistical inference, which I talk about it, we need to be pragmatic, think tanks, transdisciplinary research and glory of the research team. So here are the, some of the references are given there, but as I said, all you need to Google and you, you have a right keywords, you will find the, uh, the, the proper references from there. So I keep working. We have recently published two papers in 2021 and there are lots of work I have done with mostly with my PhD students. So, so, so now my work is, is because of the PhD students. I, I sometimes I don't feel like doing any anymore, but my PhD students keep me, keep me alive and young. So I would like to thanks all of you. And it's my special thanks goes to Professor Dr. Mohammad Iqbal Chaudhary for the invitation and his team for organizing this work. And thank you to all of you for sharing your valuable time in different time zone in the, in the globe with me. And the research is supported by the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada and other sources. I always say, oh, Canada. Thank you.
Thank you very much, sir. It was a very nice and comprehensive uh, talk. And with your permission, uh, can I take some questions for you posted in the chat box? Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, thank you. So first question is, Uh, Ms. Busha wants you to describe a bit about PCA, which is uh, principal component analysis. PCA, PCA is a, it's a century, if I may say century old technique and it was available. So that's what the statisticians say, you know, what we, in, 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 in big data, the ext extracting the information from the data that's what we are talking but this was their pc was their principal component analysis were there for a long time uh, we to to if when we have a many number of the components in your study so you you select few components uh, based on uh, by making a linear combinations of those uh, of variables and then come with few most important co components and if they can give you the maximum variation in the model that's what we want to capture so so you can do and there is some work even i'm myself working uh, doing some work that this weak coefficients through pca I can put in one group rather than individual weak coefficients. If I can put them on one group and then have few PCA and then I do my prediction further. So PCA is very useful techniques for, for data detection. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Mr. Bashir. He's asking how to deal with high dimensional data when P is greater than N since normal inverse of a matrix won't exist. Yeah, so so that's what the the problem is. So, you know, this this uh, this problem goes back to our probably high school or middle school, when the when our math professor or teacher was teaching us about number of equations, number of unknown. So, uh, because in the when p is less than n, we use least square estimation, and we are solving a system of equations. So there are p equations and which are and number of unknowns p are less than n so now number of unknowns are bigger than n so we cannot solve the the equation system of the equation so that's where the inverse of the matrix will not exist so that part comes later but in the but we were we cannot able to solve the number of uh, the this system of the equation and i remember in the high school some of us just joked with our teacher sir what happened if we have number of unknowns are more than number of equation. So sir don't know how to answer it. At that time, we are talking 30, 35 years ago. So he got upset and he said, just assume you, you know some and then make it smaller. So that's what we are doing exactly now. We don't know some, we shrink them towards zero. That's what the penalized like Lewin methods come into the picture. We use this lasso, a lasso and other techniques. So we shrink this the weak coefficients towards zero. And then in the end, we only pick the strong coefficients and which are less than n. So, so, so always use penalized likelihood method to reduce the number of variables. And then, then you get the answer. And this penalized methods, they are doing both things simultaneously. They are creating a sum model and also estimating the parameters. In my work, I said I use this technique just to get some model and I do the post estimation rather than simultaneous estimation. Thank you. Uh, here is another question. Um, he's asking, would you like to give an example in the veracity data in real problem? Uh, yeah, the the this the veracity example is is always there in the data that the the variables you have there or the due to the whether you could have been by the rounding errors which I mentioned three things, it could be where you are rounding the errors. That's the number one problems in the big data, because in a small case, if you and especially when you are doing inverting your matrices, it's become much much larger. And also when you are combining the data, so my name is Ijaz Ahmed, there is another Ijaz Ahmed, even probably the same date of birth and, and there is a criminal one 
and then the when you combine the data the records can be combined with that person and it happens at the airport when you go at the airport they look at you and the the algorithm is start working and looking at at you and then they they connect with you somebody else and so that's the the inconsistency and vorticity of the data which is almost everywhere in different shape and different form right uh, so another question is can we use elastic net for high dimensional data oh sure i did not mention probably i didn't mention elastic net there are many many penalized method so elastic nets it's it's kind of what i i did in my shrinkage estimation elastic net has two components the most penalized method has just one component l1 penalty the elastic net has two components l1 penalty and l2 penalty it's a combination of uh, lasso and plus ridge regression so it is designed to reduce the bias so so elastic net is 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 pretty good but elastic nets the problem is it can uh, it it can it still produce uh, p1 which is the number of strong variables maybe larger than n so that's a problem in the elastic net uh thank you uh, i think we can have another a uh, last question uh doesn't lasso shrink the coefficients bias towards zero i'm not sure what the mean by bias so so what have in the the way lasso algorithm is designed because you know lasso is what it's 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 nothing much than a optimization problem so you know in optimizer obtain for applied math person it's just a simple optimization problem you have a objective function and you have a different constraint uh, to to optimize it so so the constraint we put is is l1 so so the way if you if if suppose you have only beta 1 and beta 2 two parameters in 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 your model so if you look at the lasso penalty it will be diamond shape so it it shrink by 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 design it shrinks the weak coefficients towards the zero and then only keep the 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 strong coefficient if you look at the ridge ridge is a circle so ridge will give you the value of coefficient but it will not shrink it towards zero so that's the power and beauty of l1 penalty which is called lasso so that it will shrink the weak coefficient towards zero so that's for sure so for example we have this example of genomics data about 30000 variables and then the so shrinks and only found 19s are useful so we can do the shrinking the problem in the shrinking come it can shrink some weak coefficients which are useful so they have a, a strength assumption over their log pn something like that but uh, if some coefficients which shrink by lasso to a zero they should not be shrink then is a problem that's what i say combine lasso model with a another model with more variables to get a better prediction accuracy um there is another question that sure. has been asked by few and they want you to answer it based on your experience can you please tell us how oic states would be prepared for this upcoming data science world i think the as i said this is this is very is less expensive business and and then the and then the output is an output is very lucrative you know people are my uh, my student just she is actually from pakistan originally she will be defending her project uh, in a week and before that she got a very high paying job in toronto before even finishing it so so this is a very lucrative business in terms of you know as a professor i don't want to talk about money anything else but as a dean i have to talk about those things so business thing so 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 oic countries can join hands start data science program at uh, at few countries because there are more than 50s I, i i'm not sure how many countries are there i don't recall correctly uh, so they can start and pull the strength and collect the resources from outside 
of OIC. And I said, give this example, one of my uh, Thai students, I see her, Sivapon, she's here. They, they know that they have a ASEAN professorship. So they can invite people from outside, give them some professorship. Most people, scientists are not looking for money, but if you give them a good title, they might come and help you. So I have myself worked with uh, Tamasat University for for number of years, and already three PhD students produced with this data science program, and two were from Pakistan, from GC University Lahore, basically actually, and one is Thai students, and now I'm doing three more Thai students. So this can be done at OIC countries by uh, by bringing people from outside. Uh, giving them some chair position or something, not much big salary or anything else, just some research grants, and then to get the experience from them and then build your own group. That's the most important part. You cannot rely people from outside all the time. In the beginning, yes, but then build your own program and, and, and then you go from there. That's what I say, research is more important. Create a bulk of his students who can solve the data, who can solve the industry problem and, and get a good job and make money. And they don't have to get out of country like me to come to Canada, leave my family and all my friends. At that time, they can stay their home and they can get job because the jobs are online, most of these jobs, regardless of pandemic or not, these jobs are mostly online. So we have to take some creative steps in that direction. I think OIC can take it and organize it. So it started as a pilot project at as a smaller scale and then expand it. And then I think Tamasat University example is right there. Thank you very much. It was such a pleasure uh, to listen to your talk. And again, thank you for your patience, time. And I would also like to thank our participants for you know, for their presence and posting their questions, relevant questions, I would say, because this is you know a subject that is not really common. So um, with this, I would request Dr. Hena Sadiqi if she has anything to say. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, such a wonderful lecture, and uh, I still have houseful. So that uh, is basically reflecting the interest you have de developed among the participants. Lots of appreciation in the chat box. So on behalf of Sir Iqbal, uh, he had a flight uh, to catch. So he attended halfway and then he had to uh, leave for the airport. He sent his lots of greeting and appreciation and thanks uh, from his side. And uh, thank you so much for sparing time. And, Lots of good suggestion uh, regarding the uh, program, which we can initiate with the different OIC countries. Definitely, me and Kazi Maul can raise these suggestions to uh, Professor Dr. Mohammed Ibrahim. Thank you so much, sir. Once again, thank you all the participants. It's uh, again my thanks to all of you for listening to this talk and and sharing your thoughts with me. It's enjoyable. I I always enjoy this uh, scientific conversation and and also i am now i'm interested to do some some data analytics about this one that how many people from how many countries participated if you have the list please let me know and please uh, i would like to thank all the participants for taking their time so this is just the beginning of the journey it's not the end so the the knowledge it's it's accumulative we gain it every day and life is a learning experience so never lose touch of that learning experience and once again thank you all of you may god may Allah bless you all the best thank you so much thank you very much sir please share the list of participants with sir so yet uh, we have a yes. new research paper <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, i'll surely do that and thank you very much and hope to see you sometime in Pakistan as well, uh, in Islamabad particularly. You have visited Karachi, but we would like to see you in Comstock as well someday. Inshallah, as they say. Thank you. And khudafiz and bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for Allah joining us. Allah.